uh, what were we talking about again? <laughs> uh, we were talking about definition of socialism. I think the thing that I would oh, yeah. say is like you, you kind of identified socialism as like particularly meaning anti-capitalist. Uh, yeah. And I, I don't actually identify as anti-capitalist so much as post-capitalist. I think that we need to like have a new system that is able to leverage some of the like structural features of capitalism that have proven to work well while actually like embedding it within the theory of economic justice and like within a like framing that emphasizes the like dignity and autonomy of people. Uh, Cause I think that's where like the lack of justice and the lack of dignity and the lack of autonomy are really what makes capitalism part of what makes capitalism so like toxic at present. Yeah, no, that, that's that's really interesting that you're saying that because like that's the particular space in the blockchain world that I'm interested in it are these post-capitalist type of spaces and thinking that yeah. you know whether or not they want to call themselves socialists. I mean, whatever. I think that's um, at the end of the day, socialists and post-capitalists can probably learn from each other. Yeah, I mean, to the extent that like you need to find a little bit before we started recording, socialism is kind of like broadly being oriented on anti-capitalism. And I, I think the problem is that like, it's very easy to be opposed to things. What's really difficult is to come up with new solutions that are like super solutions in the sense that they solve the same problems the existing thing solves. Because if it's taken over the world, it's probably at least solving some problems. Mm. Uh, and like, we, like, I think the issue that I have is with people who want to like essentially tear down capitalism, which is not hard to find, you know, let's dismantle capitalism. It's like, okay, but you do realize that everyone on earth is getting fed by this system and it's like producing enormously more food than was ever thought possible. You know, in the past, like you look at like the green revolution and it may be doing it in ways that are environmentally unsustainable, that are like deeply unethical, that are like, you know, just kind of like destroying the earth in some ways, but it is feeding a lot of people. So like, if we're going to take it apart, we need to be building something else as well that is going to also feed us because people need food. Yeah, I mean, I think there'll be uh, you'll get a lot of uh, maybe push back on the food part if you look at uh, just i mean in america the situation right now i think uh, america has some of the worst rates of childhood poverty and and yeah. lack of food and it's one of the most capitalist countries but anyways maybe we should start off with an introduction <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I'm speaking to Dandelion Manet, who's the founder of SourceCred. Um, and SourceCred is a really interesting project. Um, but maybe before, maybe instead of me uh, explaining what it is, um, yeah, maybe I should just let Dandelion talk and explain um, what SourceCred is and what is the story behind it. Uh, so yeah, my name is Dandelion. Uh, I use they, them pronouns. And as for SourceCred, so I think like to make this, to, there, there's always, I think that always with things, there are different, there are lots of different narratives that will attach to any complex thing. And, you know, there's a story of history, like how did things come to be? And then there's a story of like current intent, like what is the thing now? Uh, and I'm going to start with the, the story of history, uh, which is for a long time, I've, I've been really interested in the question of trust and the question of how can we use technological systems to like mediate or like enhance our ability to trust each other and to coordinate. Um, if you think about what life is like in a small village, like, you know, one of the things not having actually spent time living in small villages, admittedly, one of the things I imagine is that people are like, there's a lot of communal trust. There's a lot of context. You like know everyone and you know that they can watch your kids and you can like get their help with stuff and you'll help them back. Uh, and then once you switch to a much larger social context and you go to a city, now everyone's a stranger and you have to be kind of afraid, you know, maybe of everyone, like everyone could be a potential like attacker or something. Uh, and I think that we, with the technology we have, it feels like we should be able to create new ways of scaling trust. And the, the existing systems we have for scaling trust are stuff like institutions. You know, if you got a degree from Harvard, then I trust that you like, we're smart enough to get accepted to Harvard. So that probably like tells me some things about you. But by delegating our trust to these institutions, we wind up like really needing to like depend on these centralized and often unaccountable institutions for our own ability to relate to, with each other and like coordinate together. Uh, and that kind of sucks. And so I was thinking for a long time about trying to make uh, a sort of algorithmic system for helping 
people discover who they trust. But yeah, so I was really interested in these networks of trust and like how could we build like a scalable system for enabling communities of people to trust each other. Uh, and at the time, you know, I was in Silicon Valley. Uh, I was surrounded by this kind of like startup mentality where the thing you should do is like found a company and raise a bunch of capital from VCs and then go and try to grow your business as quickly as possible uh, and become a billionaire. And I kind of realized that trying to create a trustworthy system for people to trust each other in the context of Silicon Valley capitalism, there was basically zero chance that that would actually be a trustworthy and like ethically aligned system. And in fact, it was very likely that I'd create something out of Black Mirror. Uh, if you've watched the episode Nosedive, it's a system, it's, a, it's an episode in Black Mirror where people have got this app where they're constantly giving ratings to each other. And these like reputation scores basically determine your place in society. And it's an incredibly like, like neurotic and like inhuman society. Uh, and I decided not to build this because I just saw that, you know, basically making the Facebook of like who trusts whom uh, would not be something we want. Was it before then, or after that watching the episode? I think that I had not seen the episode and then I later watched okay, Nose Dive and I was like, yeah, <laughs> that's exactly like exactly what I what I think that could have been. Yeah. Um, and so I wound up instead joining Google just to kind of have a place to like hang out and like code on stuff while I figure out what it is I actually want to do. And as the crypto bubble of 2017 started spinning up, uh, I've been interested in crypto for a long time uh, since you know early days uh, with Bitcoin and the dark web. And as the crypto bubble was spinning up, I was finding myself just so fascinated by all the projects that were getting launched. I was like, you know, sitting there reading white papers for like Augur and thinking about how fascinating it was. They're setting up this Oracle, reading like the white paper from Maker. Uh, and I kind of was feeling a renewed pull to come to the crypto sphere. Uh, and so I went and I started hanging out with my friend, uh, Juan Benet, who's the CEO of Protocol Labs. And we were just kind of riffing and he was talking about how they were working in Filecoin and how Filecoin is built on all of these uh, open source projects and really couldn't exist without an enormous stack of open source software, which was developed for free and how he really wished that they could find a way to distribute Filecoin tokens back to the creators of all of this open source corpus that Filecoin depended on. Uh, but that there wasn't really any way to do that because there's just no like metric that exists that like, would you, you know, you'd pay people based on like number of lines of code. Like that's clearly a dysfunctional solution because uh, it's so easy to game. You pay people a number of open pull requests. Yeah. Like it was really hard to see how that could work. And then I made the connection back to this reputation network concept where I had been thinking about a reputation network uh, where you are, people are kind of vouching for each other. And one of the issues there is that you need people to put in a lot of manual information that they're unlikely to do. So it's hard to spin that up. And I realized that you could instead make a reputation network on the contributions to projects. You could say, oh, you know, this pull request was merged. So it gets a, lot of, a little bit of reputation. And this pull request references this GitHub issue. And then this GitHub issue references this like forum post. And so you can start to like have the transitive flow of reputation uh, in terms of the value of the contributions themselves. And that was the core idea of SourceCrud uh, was that we could make a reputation metric for open source projects. Uh, and that that metric would meaningfully correspond to how much value people had brought to the projects. Because if you have made a lot of pull requests that got merged, or you wrote a lot of forum posts that got referenced and liked and so forth, then you would get cred. Uh, and the dual idea was to create uh, a system of crypto tokens called grain, crypto assets, where the idea is that every community would be issuing its own grain and uh, you would earn it based on your cred, so based on your contributions. And, and this is a key part that actually what I'm describing so far, cred and grain, we've built that, uh, we can get into it more, but the other key part is setting up an ecosystem where the norm is that every project uh, is going to be flowing cred to its dependencies. And so the hope is that we can finally solve this problem where like we all depend on open source infrastructure that no one is paying for, uh, that we can actually build an ecosystem in which this is all, all of the valuable labor is getting rewarded, whether or not that valuable labor had pricing power or not. Um, yeah, so maybe there's a lot more here, but I want to kind of give you, yeah. Well, I was, I was going to say that um, maybe it'd be good to talk about what are some of the issues that open source projects face um, on the regular, like 
in particular that you know source cred tries to um to answer yeah so i think that there's a just there's a really like fundamental mismatch in that open source software is tremendously valuable you know if you look at companies like google companies like amazon uh companies like facebook and if you actually look at their stack like all of their tech is built on top of open source technologies you know whether it's c plus uh, plus whether it's like yeah, the programming languages are a great example, like the open specs for like HTTP, uh, Linux is basically powering their data centers. And so the software is enormously valuable. The software has generated, you know, billions of dollars of revenue for these companies. And yet open source projects don't have the ability to charge because by nature of being open source, they are freely accessible for anyone to use. Uh, and so we've got this weird kind of parasitic relationship, right? Where like, I mean, lots of people are just like getting tons of value from the open source ecosystem and like putting value back in the form of like working in it. Uh, but we also have these massive tech giants that are getting huge amounts of value that they extract as profits without paying more than like token amounts back into the system. Uh, and I think for me, fundamentally, like I think that open source is sort of a fundamentally liberatory paradigm. Like if you imagine the possibility if, like what if all of technology were open source what if facebook were open source and so rather than facebook choosing an algorithm to show you the most like upsetting content because that'll keep your eyes glued to the screen and get as many ad impressions what yeah. if because it was open source you can choose the algorithm that you want on your feed and you can choose to have the algorithm be i want to hear good news about my friends I want to hear all news about my really close friends and from all other stuff in the world. Like if it's like something that's like outrage oriented, just like, don't show it to me. Like Facebook will not give you the setting because they would lose ad revenue. But if we're open system, then anyone could just build this for themselves. Uh, and so I think for me, like I see open source as uh, in a large part, the future of the economy. Uh, I think it's just going to be better because it's going to free more people to be more creative. It's going to allow everyone in the world to like contribute to the technology we're building rather than saying, you know, this set of people in a particular building in Mountain View, California are allowed to update Google Calendar. And it turns out they don't care about Google Calendar, so it will never get updated. Uh, and like, if you, like, I have tons of ideas on Google Calendar could be better, you know, because I use it and it's neglected. Uh, but because it's closed source, it's just impossible to touch. Yeah. So it's sort of that open source has a lot of potential, but at the moment it's being co-opted a lot of the time by big corporate players who are able to take advantage of the value being created by people who are wanting to create the software meant to be open for everyone with probably the intention of creating um, products that are available to everyone. But I think corporations largely use open source technology to then create something that they profit off of. Yeah, I mean, I will say so like, it's interesting because corporations are also big investors in open source. You know, when I was at Google, I was working on TensorFlow, which is an open source machine learning framework that's extremely valuable. Uh, and yeah. Google open source, you know, uh, Facebook open source, React, like the, the, these, the corporate players do invest in open source, but they invest in open source only in ways that are complementary to their business models. Yeah. Um, I, I think the real issue here is that like, like to scale things and to, to create scalable, stable social systems, you need incentives. Uh, and right now the incentives for working on open source are basically the incentive of doing work or, you know, the value of doing work that you think is good and the positive feedback from other people in the community also working on it, uh, and maybe like professional status or pride. And so I think partly the reason why, if you look at open source technology, it tends to be really focused on programmers. You know, we've got great open source, like text editors for coders. We've got great open source, like uh programming language and frameworks i think that's in part because programmers are willing to work approximately for free together on stuff for other programmers but i think we could have so much more in the way of open source i think we could have like open source products you know what if like what if by default your expectation was the software that on your computer or on your phone is all open source and you can like read its code you can see that it's not like stealing your information and exporting it to all kinds of weird servers and you can change it in any way you want. And the thing is that to get to that point, like building consumer grade software is actually very like difficult and expensive and requires lots and lots of different kinds of talent, you know, documentation, design, QA, lots of engineers to implement it, product managers. And right now, because open source 
there's no incentive. We don't have a way to coordinate open source projects where people actually will get paid for working on them. Uh, this just isn't happening. And so we're kind of left with like, you know, what open source exists and, you know, they're like your, the corporations are like able to like make a lot of benefit from it because then they can go and invest in all the pieces required to make the product because then they'll like find some way to extract value directly from the product. Uh, and then that value doesn't flow back to the underlying technology. So we get the issues of what's happening in open source and the difficulties in creating um, consumer products through open source, I think is uh, especially difficult. But so then maybe you can explain now how source cred works and how, you know, what would it look like a open source project using source cred? How would it lead to a good open source consumer product, for example? And so, so it's a little bit interesting here because we started here asking about the history of source cred uh, and the history of source cred was really focused on this open source narrative uh, that like source cred is going to like enable like open source projects at large to like kind of like economically flourish. And I still believe that, but I've kind of realized it's actually not the first step. Uh, open source is, I, I feel like what source cred is doing right now most immediately is allowing like decentralized crypto communities to self-organize. And so maybe like I'll kind of start there by talking about like what source cred actually like is right now and what it's doing kind of practically. And then we can like connect the dots out to different scales. Yeah. Um, source cred is basically a decentralized technology for communities to like come to agreement about how valuable different things are. Uh, I would say in a sense, it's like a decentralized form of community governance where the like nature of the governance right now is like deciding these scores over the values of contributions because that then determines how people get like remunerated for that um basically what happens when a community is using source cred is uh source cred starts collecting data from the community uh or rather the, it's more like the community uses source cred to collect their own data i, I want to be clear this is not like there's no like central source cred server that's like hoovering up your data and running algorithms it really is just like you run this and you put the scores on github because that's where people tend to put open source stuff mm -hmm. uh but if you if you can take the source cred community for an example like every time someone posts on our forums uh if that post gets liked by other people then those people liking it will flow a little bit of cred to the post uh, when people make a pull request on GitHub, if the pull request gets merged, that will like flow a little cred to the pull request. And it's not that it's not that the person liking it is paying them. Like I'm not paying for my like on a post, right? It's so the idea is basically like you've got an amount of cred that is based on the value of the contributions you did. And the rule of cred is cred is always flowing. And so the amount of cred you have, let's say you have 100 cred, is always going to be flowing out. And maybe by default, it kind of your 100 cred will flow back to just like everything else in the project. Uh, but then when you exercise, when you like communicate what you valued, if you like like something, then more of that cred instead of flowing to everything in the project will flow to the specific things you liked. Uh, so it's not at all that you lose the cred because it was always going to flow away from you, but you just kind of get to like influence where the next step of the cred flowing is going to be. Uh, and so because of this, everyone who's contributing to source cred, you know, uh, the other thing I forgot to mention is like a really big issue here is that we need to be able to recognize contributions that are not occurring on a platform like GitHub or discourse or so forth. Uh, and so to take an example, like there's no discourse post for like us recording this podcast, uh, but it clearly is relevant to source cred. Uh, so what we're doing right now is we've got a channel called props in our discord uh, where Anyone can write a props for someone else being like, you know, props to LB for hosting the community call. Uh, and then if people value that, they'll react to the message in Discord and then that will create more cred. So we kind of like are able to use that channel to like as a catch all for off platform contributions. Uh, we're, we're building better tools to do this in like a native way. Uh, but it's just really important that we like, like it's really important to us that we're not just for rewarding techies or rewarding coders. Like we want a technology that can work for all the different kinds of labor uh, that right. go into a community. So I might get some cred inadvertently for doing this podcast. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. And it's funny how well that has worked. Like, you know, people are so used to the idea that you never get paid unless you like, you know, negotiated it up front. Right. Uh, and some of the people in the source code community who have been the most valuable 
are people who kind of came and like made some art related to SourceGrad and like posted the art on the forums and then got a bunch of likes and then got paid a bunch of grain, grain being the token that like gets distributed based on credit scores. Uh, and then this artist comes back a month later and is like, whoa, I just got like paid a bunch of money for like doing art. Like that never happens. Like, wait, what's going on here? And then like, you know, that's where you start going down the rabbit hole. I think that so far, like for like, like this is the thing is that I started by thinking about source credit as an algorithm. And I'm really coming to understand that source credit is first and foremost, a community technology. You know, it's about helping people work together and helping people like be able to like reward each other and appreciate each other. Uh, in a way that's like transparent and robust to gaming. Because I know there's a couple of more different ways that you can make grain or, or, or cred. What are some of the other ways that someone in a community could like have the value that they're making for a community be counted? I'm not exactly sure that makes sense. what you mean. Like I think there's, you've mentioned um, in other interviews that, I, that I've listened to that there's like this page ranking system um, similar to how Google works that is sort of can be taken into consideration at the end, you know, once all the calculations are made for the, for the, um, the grain or cred to be uh, dispersed. So basically the first step, uh, so, so the first step in computing cred scores is to come up with a sort of network map of all of the contributions in the project. Uh, so this is called a graph, a contribution graph in the computer science sense of the word graph, which is basically a network of nodes and connections between nodes. Uh, and so we, we produce this data structure. We're going to say, okay, let's like download every issue and comment from GitHub. Let's get every single form post and like from Discord. Let's get every message and reaction from Discord. Uh, and weave these all together into a single data structure that shows how everything interrelated. Uh, then we run an algorithm called CredRank on those scores. Uh, CredRank uh, on the graph, sorry. CredRank is sort of a, a like derivative of Google's PageRank algorithm. Uh, PageRank, the basic intuition is the score of a web page is based on the score of all the web pages that linked to it. So your web page is important if important web pages link to you. Hmm. And Cred rank, the intuition is the cred of a contribution is based on the cred of the contributions that linked to it. And the cred of a contributor is based on the cred of the contributions that they authored or were referenced by or participated with, with a bunch of added features around tracking cred over time. So page rank doesn't have a concept of time. You know, there's just like a single score, but we realized it's really helpful to be able to say like, oh, you know, this person did like, earned a ton of cred in like December and then they went on vacation in January and didn't earn a bunch of cred, but then like February, they were back at it because this allows us to do things like say, you know, maybe we want to have a grain distribution policy that is trying to reward people uh, based on their current level of activity to kind of like be a salary and like make sure people who are focused on source cred can afford or other projects using source cred can like afford to stay focused on it. Uh, and maybe we want a different grain contribution policy that's just like looking and like trying to reward people based on like their long run contributions and like especially find people who were like undervalued in the past and now should get like paid more to like catch them up. Uh, and this is where the timing information is really important. Um, but yeah, so the basic process, the, the key thing to know about producing this contribution graph is that it's organized around a plugin architecture. So we wrote a plugin for GitHub, a plugin for Discourse and so forth. Uh, but you know, right now, I think some people are working on a plugin for Slack. Uh, you could maybe imagine having like a plugin for Figma. You could have, uh, we're also going to build dedicated interfaces where we're planning to work on our first like, like creditor uh, as in cred editor. So the things for editing the cred graph and like connecting, making, revealing the connections that didn't just appear from the platforms. Um, so give you an example of a way that I would really like to see source code used. Uh, I think it's not just for digital stuff. Uh, I would like to organize a physical community house for the source cred community that would run on its own cred instance. So the contributions in this community, in this like cred instance would be like, you know, so-and-so did the gardening, so-and-so took out the trash, so-and-so like hosted a party. And then it's all fractal, right? So like, you know, there's the work of hosting the party and then that decomposes into like, okay, who did the venue setup? 
who did the like managed like invites who managed food and then like within food okay you cooked dinner you made those tacos you did the booze run and we'd be like flowing cred for out to like all of the individual contributions uh with the the net goal being that like the house would be owned by everyone who had made these contributions to it uh and that like if you uh had made a lot of contributions then you could either like get paid by the house for that labor or you could get privileges you could use it to be like yeah i really think that we should reorganize this whole like laundry area because it's a mess and i'm willing to like boost that with my grain or uh i really want us to like throw this awesome party or like have this event like i'm going to boost that with my grain so you'd be able to like either like kind of exit so that you can like pay rent or use your stake in the community to direct the community towards the things you care about uh and of course since it's a house you'd also be able to like pay actual rent in the house and just like live there if you were contributing to it enough uh yeah and i think this is something uh, go ahead yeah i was just going to go into um cuz w- it's touching on something that i find really interesting which is that it takes sort of the um business model of google or like these big tech giants in a way it where it doesn't take the business model of google at all just to be right, clear, it, there's it, no similarity to google's business model it takes algorithms that google used right right so it takes like this type of technology where in the case of google or like these um or social media companies in particular they are able to extract value from something that we don't consider to be work right when i if i send a message to so and so and you know i have this network of friends that i'm sending uh, different messages to back and forth then these companies are able to extract data from those interactions in which they can then sell to advertisers and like that's how they capture the value of basically socializing with someone which you don't consider like work in your in your normal life you just consider like having fun but source cred is sort of flipping that upside down and saying you can capture all these type of things that you do like with your friends and within your community that you may not be uh, rewarded for but that actually does create value because your community values it it like creates a platform for your community to decide the the value creation um and what you value um to be evident and to like basically bring it out of the darkness because i think before you know internet really um you would never consider like talking to your friends uh, as being some value generating thing but then after you know these big tech giants kind of grew they found a way to extract value out of that um and i think that's you know that's sort of led to a lot of the issues that we have today with the internet and sort of the dystopian futures that people imagine with it at the moment um but source grid i think is um a very different way of looking at how to um how to uh, capture that value that's generated by um yeah i mean just like social yeah, so i i community. i actually i disagree with the term value capture i think that like value capture is actually like kind of like like toxic in a weird way there's going to be this chain of value you know where there's like a whole set of like people who work together to achieve a valuable outcome and the idea of value capture is everyone should be always trying to get all of this value as much as possible and extract it personally and so like like let's take an an example where uh uh let's suppose that you know i'm using instacart right and so i'm getting a grocery order uh and when i when i order something off of amazon uh there is like value that's happening where i'm like getting delivered uh some package and let's think about like in the chain of this value of this package is getting delivered to me there are lots of workers in amazon's warehouses right and these people are doing the work that causes my package to arrive to me and so they are valuable uh amazon has got control over the system and has got enormously more power than any of the workers in the warehouse and so amazon can go and say okay you know you worker added 2 dollars of value through the work of like getting this package to dandelion uh but since you have no market power and i could replace you with anyone else off the street i'm going to pay you 10 cents and the other dollar and 90 cents gets captured by amazon right amazon's very good at value capture in that sense uh i want us to be in a world in which value is not getting captured but flowing in which like like take like 
source cred as an example, like let's suppose that source cred becomes like really like an important project that lots of other projects are depending on and flowing value to. I don't want source cred to be in this mentality of great, let's like catch as much of this as possible and then like all be super rich and drive Lamborghinis to the moon or something. Uh, I want to be like, cool, let's keep a proportion of here. Let's harness the value that we're flowing so that we can like sustain ourselves and sustain our organization. And then let's keep flowing it to the projects that are using it, to the other parts of the ecosystem, to the like ecology around us, to like the communities that our people are living in. Like let's flow that value on to like the rest of the value chain. Uh, and I think that way we will not see these like weirdly like starved, like I think our communities are starved because corporations are really good at value capture. You know, and just if we if we try to just create like a new system that's supposed to be liberatory, that like has in its assumptions that it's going to be really good at value capture, I think we're going to wind up in a similar place. Oh yeah, I, 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 go ahead. Like I, I think for me, a principle in like like the sort of like economic logic of source cred, and it's different from the economic logic of capitalism. In capitalism, you are valued based on your replaceability in the market, right? So. Uh, I, as a software engineer, have got low replaceability, comparatively speaking, because software engineers are scarce. Uh, someone who's like a community support person has got high replaceability because it's like easier to find people who are not being valued with that skill set. And so if someone who's really good at like community support and someone and me both go into a job interview, I'll probably get a salary that's like, you know, significantly higher. Uh, and then maybe I'll even be a, like a bad employee and just like kind of fuck off mostly and like play weird office politics game, and, like hang out with my like coworkers or something. But because I got valued by the market, I'll just keep on getting rewarded so much better than this community support person who might be doing much better and much more valuable work. Uh, and so in source cred, the principle is you should get rewarded based on the value you provided, not based on your replaceability in the market. So like if someone is coming and like doing super valuable community support in source cred, uh, who cares that if they were working for a big tech company, they would have like gotten like a super, like, you know, bare minimum wage, like the stuff is there in here is valuable. Let's like reward it, you know? No. Uh, so I think that's part of where they're just like different foundational assumptions about value than within source cred than are like the case in capitalism. Hey everyone, if you're enjoying this episode so far, be sure to subscribe, leave a review, share with a friend, and join the crypto leftist communities on Discord or Reddit, which you can find in the links in the show notes. If you want to be sure that more content like this can be created, you can donate to my efforts through Patreon. So if you go to patreon.com slash the blockchain socialist, you can donate starting at $3 a month and help me out and join the newest patrons like Sean and Enki. At the moment, I've spent more on this project than I've ever earned from it due to hosting costs, so any amount really helps. As a patron, you'll get a shout out on an episode like I just did and access to monthly Patreon exclusive Q&A episodes where you can submit questions you'd like me to answer and I'll give my thoughts in roughly 20 minutes. On the latest episode of the Patreon exclusive Q&A episode, I gave my thoughts on the question about markets versus planning under socialism using blockchain. Of course, I'll still be making free content like this interview to help spread the message that blockchain does not need to be used to further entrench capitalist exploitation if we put our efforts into it. So if that message resonates with you, I hope you'll consider helping out. As you probably heard, there was an increase in quality in my audio because at first I forgot to start recording on my own end to make sure I have better audio quality, which is what I usually do. But maybe it's an important thing to point out that with the money I get from Patreon, I can buy a better microphone, for example, to give a more pleasant listening experience. And really quickly, I just want to add because as I was re listening to the interview, I thought maybe some of the things I said could be misconstrued. Socialism is of course a lot more than just anti-capitalism since you can be anti-capitalist and think that feudalism or slavery were better economic systems, but those aren't commonly held beliefs, or at least I'd like to think. Sometimes I say things during interviews that aren't fully thought out because it's very literally me thinking on the spot while recording and I don't want to try to edit every little thing I say that I might cringe at myself for because I'm trying to be as authentic as possible and honestly it's really annoying to do that much editing. But I think that's enough for me, let's go back to talking about source cred. Oh yeah, absolutely. And, and this touches on something that we were talking about a bit before, but um, and I, I I know that you're not, you don't, you don't consider yourself a socialist, but what I found interesting is that it touches on a pretty common argument that happens between anti and pro capitalists, where pro capitalists will say that socialism is bad because doctors will get paid the same as janitors. Um, but this argument, I think, is a bit funny because 
it actually goes against the logic of the market, which doesn't actually care about this misconstrued like um, sense of utility. Um, since like market logic is basically whatever the market values and whether or not there is utility or not doesn't really matter. I mean, just look at the example of, you know, uh, people who work in finance get paid extraordinary amounts compared to like teachers. Comp- uh, you know, the amount of utility, I think is probably, um, I think you could argue is more for teachers. Um, but so it's funny you bring that up because that's actually an example I use a lot. Uh, <laughs> I think that in like the source cred paradigm, teachers will get paid a lot more than private equity analysts. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Comrades, under source cred, <laughs> we will be valued better. Um, but so, yeah, I, th- I think it's, it's pretty interesting because, yeah, source cred goes against this. Um, it's a, an example of a type of anti-capitalist value accounting. Now, I guess you would agree with that. Yes. Again, I, used, I just identify as the term post-capitalist. Like, I, I, think that, I think that, like, capitalism's flaws make it weak, make it, like, ripe for replacement. Uh, I, I don't feel like, I feel like once we can create a system that just, I, I think people know that capitalism is not fucking working, right? This is not like some well-kept secret where only the like privileged few have like pierced the veil. Like, no, like we are living in this world. We know that shit is fucked. It's like very transparently fucked. And I think the issue is like, that this is why I don't identify as a socialist. I feel like what I see as like socialist policy is like, let's have some top-down policy from the federal government to like try to like intervene in the market to like make things better. And the idea that top-down federal intervention is going to fix anything, like at least I'm speaking from an American perspective where we've got an entirely dysfunctional government. You know, we've got a government where like whether or not to support people who are like, you know, being thrown into like homelessness and poverty by the pandemic. Like it's not really clear if, if the government wants to do that or if it only wants to support corporations. And so the idea that like, we're going to like enact like policy through the means of the state in order to rectify capitalism feels far-fetched to me. Uh, I think we need to just fundamentally build a post-capitalist system that is like a better paradigm that is like a paradigm that will give people more like autonomy that will let people be valued multidimensionally for all of the like value that they bring to the world. And that once we can do that, it will just outcompete capitalism. People will be like, cool. Yeah, we're done with capitalism. Like it's an abusive shitty system. Now that there's something else, let's just switch to it. But it's the like there being something else that we need so we can make the switch. Because if what you're telling people is like, hey, capitalism sucks and I have no other solution, but let's tear it down and just like be in the darkness together. People are terrified of having no system at all, rightly, justly so, I think. And so I think that's why this is such a flash button issue. And I don't think it's actually because there's like a real disagreement about whether or not capitalism is working. I think people are just protesting against the lack of it. People, people, I feel like a lot of the people who are like anchored in supporting capitalism are really just expressing their fear of the unknown. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, I mean, to your first point, I think one of the problems that socialism has had in the in recent history is largely a problem of uh, misinformation and like sort of marketing. Um, like I think that uh, people think that socialism is when the government does stuff, um, and that the more stuff that the government does, eventually it's socialism, um, and that's a problem. I think. You know, I think related to the Cold War and all these other things, um, which has uh, misconstrued the idea of socialism as being like, oh, it's when the federal government imposes a new regulation or something like that, um, which is, uh, I think, a detriment to the actual progress of society and trying to think of like new ways to do it. But I do agree with, I mean, the other point you're making, trying telling people that capitalism isn't working, but then not having a clear alternative of what the of what the alternative world to capitalism looks like and like how, how that would look like in their everyday lives i do agree i mean that's something that should be made a lot more clear to people um so that they can i mean support moving beyond capitalism moving to a post-capitalist uh, society so my next question was um what types of communities would you see uh, do you see as being the most interested in source cred at the moment? And are there any types of communities that you would recommend as being better or worse for the use of source cred? Uh, so the first thing I'll note is like source cred is still, it's still very early days for source cred. This is like a really like, like complex piece of technology that sits at the intersection of like how people are valued and like what contributions matter. And uh, there's a lot of nuance to it. 
Um, the communities, we've got a couple communities who are actively using source code. And the shared thing tends to be communities that want to be truly decentralized. Uh, because, you know, traditionally in the blockchain world, like we really uh, value decentralization, but we aren't actually good at paying people in decentralized ways to like work together on stuff. And so if you look at all these decentralized protocols, you'll often find that there actually is a centralized team building the protocol where, you know, there's like a company, they formed a company, they raised a couple million dollars from like some VCs and they hired employees to go and like build this decentralized tech. Uh, and it's a kind of inherent contradiction in the space right now, but it reflects the fact that we don't really know how to organize labor in decentralized ways. We know how to do it in a centralized way. And so we're starting to see experiments with source cred of like basically DAOs, uh, distributed autonomous organizations that really like don't want to have that centralized like CEO deciding everyone's salary. Uh, and so that's an area where I think like, even though source cred is currently still immature and even though source cred still has got like issues to work through, uh, it's better than having a CEO because that goes against the whole point. Uh, and it's definitely better than like counting your pull requests or like, you know, just kind of like, like naive systems, like based on counting. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's better than having everyone vote on everyone else's salary because that's actually like not a healthy social dynamic. You need like a, a more like accountable framework that isn't just about people having popularity contests. Uh, so those have been the communities that have been most like keen on source code. I would say the, the most like prominent is uh, MakerDAO, uh, which has got a kind of very active governance community of people discussing like how to keep the MakerDAO system working well economically and how to change like the amounts of different forms of uh, collateral that are accepted in the system. And they are now all getting paid for their contributions on the forms through source code. Uh, where basically the MakerDAO Foundation is paying a die budget uh, to reward everyone who's contributing to governance. And we've got plans in motion to actually uh, bring that kind of on, uh, on to the Maker protocol directly, uh, where the funding would come from the protocol and not from the Maker Foundation. What are SourceCred's plans for also decentralizing? I know that SourceCred has basically its own, um, it's essentially it's, it is a DAO in a way, isn't it? Yeah. I would say SourceCred is like a DAO that's like in the process of being born. Mm. Uh, right now, it's not like, right now it's got a fair bit of centralization. Uh, the most notable centralization is around uh, me personally, because <laughs> I'm the temporary benevolent dictator of SourceCred. And so our like formal governance process is that we try to do stuff by consensus. And then if there's like a serious dispute, then I can like make the call, uh, which in practice hasn't happened very much, but it's clearly not a decentralized model. Uh, I want to push, oh, we also got centralization in the sense that like our, our funds are like managed by a treasurer with like a crypto wallet that's like redeeming like die to people rather than just all being on chain through trustless infrastructure. Uh, I think it's a real priority for source code to decentralize. Uh, I would really like to not be the temporary benevolent dictator this time next year. I'd really like us to switch over like to just be using cred scores as like an input to a governance process. Um, so I think, I think there's a couple different dimensions of decentralization here. There's like governance decentralization. How can we make decisions without me being a special actor? Uh, there's like economic infrastructure decentralization. How can we like have all of our grain and currencies be managed on chain rather than uh, kind of like, like ad hoc off chain? Uh, there's leadership decentralization. How can we come up with a like leaderful organization where there are still clear leaders making decisions because you need leaders and you need them to make decisions. I don't think you can have an organization function without that, but we need those leaders to be not embedded in a hierarchy where like every leader has got like a super leader onto the top, but instead a model where parts of the community can select their own leaders and there isn't like a central super leader controlling it. Um, and then there's also like questions of technical decentralization. Like it's, it's how can we make really good oracles for the source cred scores so that you don't need to trust whoever was like happening to run the algorithm for you. Uh, so that's, that's kind of like the, the landscape of decentralization around source cred. And I think that in the coming year, it's going to be a pretty uh, high priority for us to make some progress here. Yeah, nice. Then. Yeah, I guess. How, how do you see SourceCred growing in in the next couple of years in the future? 
besides the, the decentralization part i mean in terms of maybe features or like things that technically you got you would like source cred to work on yeah so the biggest thing is that we're going to be working uh in the beginning of next year we're going to start work on the creditor uh which is basically going to be a tool for letting anyone in the community uh a like express that there was some contribution that happened you know whether it was not it was like on a platform b express how contributions relate to each other like saying oh you know actually like this pull request was really related to the fact that on a community call so and so suggested like a change or a feature and like connect that cred and then that would mean that some cred would go to the person suggesting it some cred would go to the community call itself and the host and all the other people participating in that discussion you just be able to add those missing connections in the cred graph uh and also to let people boost things where you could use your grain rather than like withdrawing it for like cash you could use it to kind of fund other things in the project that you think are important uh so maybe i could like you know maybe i could boost like oh we really need to like have a new feature or we need to fund a translation of the documentation because there's like a really big community coming in like the spanish speaking world uh or it could be like i want to boost the idea that we should have like throw a super awesome like little conference for ourselves in the mountains in colorado and like then have a party like you know just so whatever you value in the community uh so that's a really big part that i want to build uh i think generally building out the ability to use source cred for governance where i think that one of the issues that you really have uh in current blockchain governance systems is that they assume you know nothing about the humans and you know nothing about the human relationships and all you have is like token balances uh so you kind of get stuck with like plutocratic systems and with source cred you actually have a lot of context in the community you know you can go and say like things like okay you know maybe in the governance system if it's a design question then all of the people who have the most design cred are going to have voting power uh if it's a question that affects a particular community then the people who have got cred that's related to working with that community will have voting power uh if it's a question that affects everyone like you know what our like core policies should be then everyone gets to vote in proportion to their cred but you wouldn't have to worry about the civil attacks because it's not like you can just spin up a thousand new bot accounts and vote with them because they won't have any cred like it won't it won't carry any weight um yeah. i'm also really really excited to start building out the source cred ecosystem uh the first rule of the source cred ecosystem is you pay your dependencies and so any project that like wants to use source cred and be part of the ecosystem needs to pay their dependencies uh right now that like one way in which that particularly manifests is like paying source cred because source cred is a dependency but we really want to like actually just like build out the whole vision of like eco projects getting paid for the value they bring uh and i'm starting to see projects like uh i've spent some time talking to the balancer team uh, in the past couple of weeks and i think that they've built a super valuable technology that like source cred and many other projects in the source cred ecosystem are going to need uh so i want to get them in the source cred ecosystem and then i want us to all start paying them you know cuz like they <laughs> built something really valuable that like i think we should use so like let's let's reward that and we're going to build need to build more uh to like over time to like support this like ecosystem uh in terms of like institutionalizing the connections between the cred instances uh yeah there's there's a lot to do uh there's yeah. it's like can be kind of like overwhelming how many different things we need to build but i'm just like excited that we're getting more people involved in building it so it's less and less uh on my shoulders and more like you know we'll work <laughs> together and get it done uh decentralization is nice for you i guess as well <laughs> in a sense <laughs> i can't wait to like not feel a sense. I, i can't wait to like not feel like the personal the responsibility is like all sitting on like my shoulders as the tbd i'm like you know in the past year i went from being basically the only core person on source cred to being one of like 10 core people on source cred and like that alone like is so nice to see other people who also care and like know that i just don't need to all do it myself no yeah. it's really nice to uh, to grow a community for sure so yeah i guess um to top it off where can people go and keep up with the progress in, of source cred and keep up with you and learn more uh well The best place to learn more about SourceCred is the SourceCred website, which is sourcecred.io. Uh you can read some docs, you can like learn a bit more about SourceCred there. I would really recommend coming to a SourceCred community call. They are every Tuesday at 11 a.m. Pacific. Uh you can see it on the calendar by going to sourcecred.io/calendar. And they're just a super like lovely welcoming uh space. Uh you know, people who come, like we all like kind of 
share who we are, talk about how we're doing, and then kind of like just start answering questions about source cred. Uh, I think it's the best community call in crypto. I think you should like come and hang out and you'll just enjoy yourself. And I, 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 was, in, I was in one of those calls once and uh, there was a bit of talk about communism. Just want to add that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, if you want to follow me, I'm on Twitter. I frankly don't tweet that much right now, but like I might again. So sure, follow me. Maybe you'll get like a good, a little, <laughs> little, little pearl of, of dandelion wisdom here and there. Uh, but I'm Decentralion like decentralized lion, you know, not decentralized cool. land, which people often confuse it for. Uh, but yeah, I'm decentralized on Twitter. Very cool name. Yeah. And I'd also say like, like, I think that source cred is unusual among crypto projects and that we like just, we really value like technically skilled people, but we also really value emotionally intelligent people. And we've like kind of identified that like to have a healthy community, you need a lot of like like emotionally aware humans like working together to like make that like a safe and healthy space uh and so if you feel like you don't have the skills that are usually like required by like tech projects i would still encourage you to like come hang out have a nice chat and you might be surprised no nice i was definitely surprised when i went all right. Thanks a lot, Dan Line, for taking the time. Um, I'm really looking forward to how uh, SourceCode develops, and I'll definitely be keeping an eye on it.